targeted the enemy, reducing a human being to a few salient points. Then, he made a quick decision based on imperfect information. Kill, capture, exploit, or source. Manning was crippled with remorse after what he described as a targeting mission gone bad in Basra. Shortly thereafter, he allegedly began leaking evidence of war crimes. That's an expression that is tautological, given that war itself is a crime. His first and most potent revelation came in the form of a notorious bug splat video entitled Collateral Murder, which many of you have probably seen. That video documented the slaughter by two U.S. Apache helicopter gunships of 12 innocent civilians, and two children were among the wounded. The perpetrators of the atrocity were heard on the recording blaming the parents of the children for bringing them into a war zone. The invaders apparently didn't take into account the fact that they had made a war zone out of a residential neighborhood. Former U.S. Army Specialist Ethan McCord, who can be seen in the video heroically attempting to carry the wounded children to safety, has testified that this war crime was the product of a standard operating procedure dictating 360-degree rotational fire in residential neighborhoods in retaliation for IED attacks on occupation troops. If Private First Class Bradley Manning did what he's accused of, he is a hero of mine, writes McCord, not because he's perfect, but because in the midst of it all, he had the courage to act on his conscience. But conscience has no place in the Empire's hierarchy of values. It is sand in the gears of imperial violence for which conformity is the optimal lubricant. There is no proper place in the imperial machinery for reflection or moral honesty. Just a day before the massacre at Sandy Hook, the Republican-led House, House Judiciary Committee killed by unrecorded voice vote a resolution co-sponsored by Ron Paul and Dennis Kucinich which would have required the Obama administration to account for its targeted killing program overseas. Think about this for a second. If one of us knew, as a matter of moral certainty, that Adam Lanza had survived and was going to kill again, wouldn't we do everything we could do to stop him? This is the same kind of a moral proposition. This congressional committee knew that Obama was going to kill again by way of unmanned, remote-controlled drones. And they killed a resolution requiring that he provide a legal explanation for this practice. That was the work of the Republicans in that committee. Republicans of the sort whose expansive skepticism of government power does not extend to the killing of innocent people overseas. On the same day that this happened, a car bomb attack in Syria was carried out by a terrorist group that is part of a coalition that Mr. Obama claims is the legitimate representative of the Syrian people. That atrocity claimed the lives of 24 people, many of them children. When Obama was given the news of the mass murder at Sandy Hook, he was at the White House, where he's probably reviewing plans for expanding the proxy war in Syria. That's a country that's ruled by a hideous dictator, who until recently was a subcontractor for the CIA's torture program. Obama was notified of the schoolhouse massacre by National Security Advisor John Brennan, who is the keeper of the official kill list. That's a roster containing the names of people selected by a secret White House panel as suitable targets for summary execution. A few hours later, Mr. Obama, acting in the capacity of the high priest of the regime's civil religion, went before the press corps to begin the liturgy of official mourning. Referring to the victims at Sandy Hook, Obama, wiping away a non-existent tear as dictated by his teleprompter, <laughs> intoned, they had their entire lives ahead of them, birthdays, graduations, weddings, and kids of their own. Every time children die in an outbreak of violence, Mr. Obama claimed, I react not as a president, but as anybody else would as a parent. We've endured too many of these tragedies in the past few years. Now, after pronouncing the familiar facile phrases of selective sympathy, Obama said that he and his wife would hug their children a little closer tonight as he empathizes with the parents whose children were murdered, whose children were murdered in Newton, Newtown. It's doubtful that he was moved to similar thoughts of vicarious bereavement as he contemplated the parents in Pakistan, Yemen, and Afghanistan who have been left childless because of his actions. Right. Last July, following the murderous attack at a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, Mr. Obama uttered a similar assortment of potted phrases. 
He then announced that he would travel to Aurora to bless its traumatized residents with his healing presence. He carefully omitted mention of the fact that just a few months year earlier, he had personally ordered the murder of a 16-year-old Colorado native named Abdel Alalaki, who, along with eight other entirely innocent people, was vaporized in a drone-fired missile attack while he was enjoying a backyard barbecue at the house of a friend in Yemen. Referring to the Aurora Massacre, Mr. Obama said in his July 21st radio address, we may never understand what leads anyone to terrorize their fellow human beings. Such evil is senseless, beyond reason. Apparently, the routine state terrorism committed by Obama and the government over which he presides is both sensible and rational. In order to clarify the distinction that Mr. Obama touched upon, it's useful to recall the comments of dear leader emeritus Bill Clinton from an interview published in the December 2009 issue of Foreign Policy. Mr. Clinton helpfully defined terrorism as, and I quote, killing and robbery and coercion by people who do not have state authority. The institution of government is a kind of philosopher's stone through which moral alchemists transmute base crimes like killing and robbery into noble acts of public policy. Last April, in response to the modest but growing public outrage over the Obama regime's use of killer drones, John Brennan, whom we referred to earlier, gave a self-congratulatory speech insisting that the program was legal because those who preside over it consider it to be. Killing people by way of robot-delivered missiles is legal, ethical, and wise, he declared. The targeted execution of individuals deemed to be terrorists without the benefit of trial or any pretense of due process is the result of careful deliberation and conducted in a way that discriminates between combatants and bystanders, Mr. Brennan maintained. This must mean that Barack Obama and the people who are sufficiently foolish and depraved to obey his orders intended to kill 16-year-old Abdel Alawaki. That was something they intended to do. Seeking to justify the murder of that child, the Obama administration initially circulated the story that the 16-year-old was actually an adult suspected of being a militant. Now this is obviously another example of the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. The administration disavowed that story, but it never dropped the pretense that the summary execution of that innocent U.S. citizen was, in some sense, a strategic success. Since the regime killed him, and in its sovereign wisdom, the regime is never wrong, the young man simply couldn't be innocent. The regime has never explained why it murdered that child, let alone apologize to the family for doing so. The closest it has come to an explanation was offered last September by former White House spokes liar Robert Gibbs, who actually claimed that the teenager's death was his own fault because he had somehow made a, cho a poor choice of fathers. I would suggest that you should have a far more responsible father if they're truly concerned about the well-being of their children. On this construction, would it be morally appropriate for a Pakistani or Yemeni whose children died at Obama's hands to attack his children because of the murderous irresponsibility of Mr. Obama? Of course not. That's an abhorrent thought. But that's the logic, such as it is, that was used by the regime to defend the murder of that 16-year-old U.S. citizen a few weeks after they had murdered his father, whose name had been inscribed on Brennan's kill list. How does the murderous logic that justifies attacks on residential neighborhoods in Pakistan differ from whatever rationale drove a maniac to open fire on a kindergarten class in Connecticut? Assuming that the shooter was deranged, he at least had the excuse of insanity. Obama, Brennan, Gibbs, and their allies, by way of contrast, all profess to be entirely sane. For the Obama regime, child killing is an instrument of policy. And this was made clear, as AJ adverted to earlier, in this piece that was published in the Military Times talking about how it is official policy now in Afghanistan to treat children as potential antagonists if they display an understandable entirely human resentment for the presence of foreign occupation troops in their communities. The very existence of that resentment is looked upon as sufficient cause to treat children as legitimate military targets. Right. What, the, what Adam Lanza did once, in a fit of irrationality, the regime over which Obama presides does practically every day, and the killing is carried out by people who act with clear-eyed, clinical indifference to the suffering that they inflict. The killer who slaughtered the innocent at Sandy Hook is dead. The child-killing apparatus over which Obama presides continues merrily along, and it is targeting us. 
In recent days, we've learned that the National Counterterrorism Center, the agency headed by that same John Brennan, now has access to a master database that effectively abolishes citizen privacy. When that database was approved last May, former Department of Homeland Security Privacy Officer Mary Ellen Callahan warned that this would be a sea change in American society because whenever citizens have any interaction at all with government at any level, the first question to be asked will be, is this person a terrorist, or at least a potential terrorist? This database is central to Brennan's disposition matrix. That's Norwellian term describing a system that will be used to make pattern of life rulings regarding the detention, imprisonment, or summary execution of people, including U.S. citizens, who are deemed to be enemies of the regime. By the way, I don't see how any decent person could not be an enemy of this regime. Now, while we are gathered here, the government that presumes to rule us is conducting a Sandy Hook-style killing somewhere in the world. That's an inescapable fact. Its victims have neither the means nor the desire to harm us. They most likely would not be our enemies were it not for the actions of what we're told to refer to as our government. Right. Government is the practice of socially licensed lethal force. It is rooted in violence, it flourishes through aggression, and its fruit is mass murder. It makes nothing of any value. The only things that government makes are criminals out of innocent people, corpses out of living human beings, and enemies out of people who otherwise would have no reason to resent each other. To paraphrase words given to us through the prophet Isaiah, those who rule us have made a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. We see in the state-sponsored and state-approved and conducted and subsidized murder of children from the unborn in the womb through those who are on the steps of Central Asia, the work of this covenant with death, and the protocols they are devising that treat us all as targets for indefinite detention or summary execution proves that we will not be given any happy immunity from the consequences of that covenant. It's a somewhat hackneyed cliche, but it is nonetheless true. If we do not end war, war will end us. That means we must withdraw our consent at every opportunity that presents itself to us from the act of blood, the acts of aggression carried out supposedly in our name. One of the biggest problems we have conceptually is pronoun trouble. We're told to think of the government as us. We're told to say, we do thus and such, or we do this and that, to them. There is no us, quite frankly, to which I belong that also includes Barack Obama and his regime. My country is with me today. It's my wife and my six children. They do not belong to the state in any sense, and they never will. Liberty begins with the recognition of self-ownership and the reciprocal respect for self-ownership on the part of everybody else. That's the non-aggression principle, and it's also the golden rule. Our only alternatives are either the golden rule or the iron fist of tyranny. May God give us the gift of peace, and may he give us the courage and wisdom to accept it. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, I know it's awfully chilly. I appreciate you staying. There's something about this war that is, it's one of the most dire subjects that we face today. We really have a choice. It's either going to be the war or it's going to be us. We cannot survive this empire when it comes to the end that all empires come to. Um, and I hope that you'll all go out and do something for peace. I hope that you will engage in this battle in however you can, however you see fit. Like I said, we don't have to unite, but we need to spread. There needs to be more people at rallies. There need to be more people speaking. These ideas must come to the public square. Has to come sooner rather than later. One last thing, we've got the canned food drive still going on. If you, if you have any to donate, please bring it over to the box by Amanda on the far side of the tree. And there's hot, cho hot chocolate and coffee right here. Let's hopefully finish it up before we take it away. But thank you guys very much for coming out. I appreciate it.